Hello. How are you doing? This is our uh, fourth now uh, meeting in Agile Minds Romania. Hi, hi, Viorella. Hello. Hi, hi. Hello, uh, hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, so um, for tonight, we have a special guest, uh, Fred Deichler. Uh, and he is going to be sharing uh, some insights from forecasting and uh, uh, value perspective uh, approaches that uh, that he uses. Uh, but before we get there, I just want to uh, let you know this is going to be a recorded session. We're going to have uh, a few people uh, sharing uh, information and uh, you you will be able to also see the recording afterwards so when we're done uh, uh, we will probably post uh, the live recording in a few hours time uh, as well so as people are uh, gathering up for, for our talk uh, and before I, I, I know it will take some time until everyone, uh, yeah, joins the room. Uh, we've prepared. Uh, 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 yeah. Ah, no the microphone was not on mute. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. So we've prepared some quick questions just to to, to play a little game. So to 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 get some engagement from you guys, uh, we're gonna do this using the chat. So we have four questions. So we're gonna ask the questions uh, and also place the question in the chat. You can see them in the chat. I'll, I'll read the questions anyway. And you're answering in the chat, right? One answer, one answer per person, right? Quick answer. You don't have to think about it too much. The first thing that comes into your mind regarding that uh, is a good answer, right? <laughs> Everything you say is uh, safe, uh, is just... Uh, a matter of uh, getting people uh, be more present and uh, collaborate in our talk. So this is our first one. It goes, how many types of Agile have you encountered so far? Yeah, so let's see it in the chat. The chat will also be exported. Exported, right? Um, <laughs> Capital A and lower A <laughs> from Fred. Thanks. Two sorts of Agile from Gabriel. Yeah. Why just two, right? <laughs> uh, which two? Scrum and XP. Okay. Thanks, Gabriel. Um, what other answers? So the, the question is again how many types of Agile have you encountered so far? Too many to count. Yeah. <laughs> oh, someone has discovered a safe way <laughs> to, to be agile. Okay. What else? Adapting. Adapt the adaptation. Who do you book that? Well, that gets you to, to quite a few variants, right? Yes. I think that's a good thing, right? We we're we're approaching changes uh, openly, so why not have uh, quite a number of uh, ways in which we uh, we use uh, Agile principles. Uh, that's great. So yeah, Gabriel, one one more. So it's three in the end of Gabriel, right? You added Kanban. It's actually four. Oh. Four, because it's safe also. So. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, you see, so yeah, many things uh, are done in many ways. Uh, uh, the next question is, uh, drum rolls, let's see. It's a bit tougher, right? So get prepared. What is the one thing hindering a better Agile adoption in your organization? Just one thing, name one, could be many. <laughs> but if it's one thing, what's that? Well, that's the question. So the answers still go here into the chat. Let's see what's the one thing hindering agile adopt adoption in your organization. Maybe the top thing hindering it, right? <laughs> uh, reluctance to change, leadership, attitude, management. What else? Uh, 
Change is bringing risks. Right? Who, who knew that? Right? <laughs> Uh, we're not changing to something we we always control, right? Uh, everything is um, um, under a great amount of unknown unknowns when you talk about change. <laughs> what will change? <laughs> what really will change in the end? So uh, again, the question is, what is the one thing hindering a better agile adoption in your organization? And you can place your answer in the chat. We'll export the chat and we can share it with everyone at the end of this just to... Have a bit of fun. Not sharing it to your bosses, right? <laughs> I took a screenshot. Oh, okay. Anyway, the meeting is recorded, Mihai, so. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, we'll leave it uh, about uh, 20 more seconds, and then we'll, we'll go to our third question. So you get prepared, right? Questions get heavier and heavier, right, to answer. This is not an exam question anyway. It's just maybe uh, you want to add something. So what's the one thing hindering a better Agile adoption? We have a few answers. Let's get to the next question. This is for all of you guys. So remember, I'm pasting the, the, the question in the chat and you can answer there. What is a thing that changed a lot in your Agile context during the past six to 12 months? something that changed, right? Agility comes with changes. Mm, that gets you thinking. Something must have changed since you're agile, right? <laughs> it's a change for the better. It's a change for I don't know, an unexpected uh, uh, blocking issue. It's a change from roles perspective. It's a change from uh, tools or Techniques you're using, maybe it's a change on the um, market conditions. I don't know. Think about it. The inflation in Jira tickets has risen a lot, Gabriel. <laughs> I think that's that's always a high number. <laughs> it's two digit number at any, any time of year, right? Um, higher than the actual inflation anyway. Um, the type of contracts change from time and material to fixed price. Oh, that's interesting. That's one thing could that could get hindering the agile adoption, right? Right, right. <laughs> okay. And again, the question, third question, if you want to put an answer in right now, what is the thing that changed a lot in your agile context during the past six to 12 months? So, yeah, maybe a year, something changed radically. So now you're agile, but you have to do things in a different way. <laughs> or you chose to do things in a different way. Something else has emerged. Um, see some more answers from Roxy. Increased micro-reporting. Oh, sorry to hear. Lower trust. Christina has one. An even more dynamic product backlog with a lot of new changes and priorities. Okay. Team size doubled. That's a good thing. But to, to what number? <laughs> uh, scope as well. Scope, scope double as well, Radu. And the deadlines are the same. Fortunately not. <laughs> Fortunately not. <laughs> Okay, so not escaping the iron triangle, right? Still. Mm. <laughs> okay, um, dropping even more of the desired agile adoption at the organizational level due to bad practices and false agile way of working. Oh, okay, that's a deep one, well done. Which is promoted to be agile, okay, in, in a way. Um, so the reason for the third question actually is maybe we think of uh, some um, uh, topics for our future encounters or our future meetings. So if something is relevant to uh, some new context you are in, right? And it's also something hindering agile, agile process adoption and something that's on your mind. 
Yeah, why not? We we can give it a try in one of our future talks. So thanks for for contributing with this. We'll we'll have the chat uh, around and we can export it. So now this is the fourth question and final one. It's a fun question. Uh, this this will go pretty quick. I hope so. Don't have to worry too much about it. So just for fun, uh, what would you choose as a hashtag for your road to mastering agility? We have perseverance. perseverance. Never yeah. give up. In God we trust. Uh, Raise the, the journey. Data. Very well, Fred. Kaizen for life. Kaizen for life. Okay. Small changes. Continuous changes. Um, I thought I heard someone saying mission impossible, <laughs> but I hope not. <laughs> uh, team power. That's good. Thank you, Irina. Um, okay, feel free to add more if you if you have. Yeah, so it's it's your agile journey, right? What what yeah. made an impact? So it's it's your hashtag for it. Okay, just uh, gathering up a few more ideas, and then I will uh, uh, pass it to Florin to present our speaker tonight and the theme that we're going to uh, be reflecting on. Um, and with that, I give it to you, Florin. Thank you. Thank you, Mihai. So welcome again, everybody. I'm really pleased to uh, uh, have the honor to present Fred, our, our guest for today. Uh, thank you, Fred. Uh, how are you, man? I'm doing wonderful. Again. I'm so happy Excellent. to be here. Excellent. Thank you. We are also very happy to have you here. Uh, guys, uh, I will uh, send the link uh, in the chat with the mural board. Uh, you have the chance there to add your questions for Fred and for uh, uh, Agile Minds team, if you have. So uh, during uh, Fred's uh, presentation, you may also add there or write in the chat. Uh, uh, feel free to choose anyway. Uh, Fred, uh, people could ask questions during your talk also, or uh, you prefer at the end? How do you prefer? Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, feel free to raise your hand to ask a question during. I might say it's coming up on the next slide, um, <laughs> but you know, don't be afraid to ask me questions or stop me. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, okay, let me introduce a little bit uh, uh, Fred. So Fred, for over two decades, he has been a technology leader, and uh, he's intuitively following the Scrum values and the Agile principles even before he discovered them. So uh, he has successfully led multiple teams on their agile journeys, emphasizing the importance of a harmonious balance between people, processes, tools, and always striving for uh, continuous improvement. Uh, for Fred, uh, as crucial as professional development, also personal growth is really important. And um, he will uh, uh, talk today about the free force of predictive delivery. Uh, it's a really uh, nice uh, uh, presentation and uh, looking forward for it. Uh, so uh, that being said, uh, no further uh, uh, things. Uh, Fred, the stage is yours. Uh, we are looking forward for uh, what you will share with us. Thank you. Um, uh, I think you need to enable me to be able to share my screen. Absolutely, Mihai. <laughs> yeah. yeah, here you go, Fred. There we go. All right, so hopefully everyone can see this. Um, I won't be able to look at Mural or the chat probably while I'm doing this. I have two monitors, but the setup, I just changed some stuff. So, yeah, so welcome to Zelda's Guide to the Triforce of Predictive Delivery. So um, who here, by you can uh, do some emojis in the uh, chat or in the reaction, has played this video game, Legend of Zelda on the Nintendo Entertainment System, the original Nintendo. I 
Excellent. See a little bit. Yeah, so this is uh, themed that way, uh, but it is not 100% canon. So forgive me if something, don't don't hold hold something against me. If you're like, that's not quite right. Uh, additionally, this presentation, I do use some generative AI images. I've tried to clean them up a little bit. So um, so yeah, so just ride with the journey on me. So yes, so Zelda's Guide to Agile, the Triforce of Predicted Delivery. Or as I like to say, how to turn waterfall nightmares into agile delivery dreams. My name is Fred Deichler. Uh, I just want to mention I'm an Agile Coach International Speaker based out of Grants Pass, Oregon, which is on the west coast of the U.S., right above California. It is 9 a.m. for me. Uh, I normally start my day at 6 a.m., just based where my company is headquartered. Um, but yeah, and I've been getting out uh, speaking for the past year and a half or so, and I really love embracing uh, the global Agile community. And one thing I do like to say is that uh, I enable effective and efficient teams by leveraging processes and tools to aid individuals in interaction. It's not one over the other. I feel like it's a big aid. And if we're not connected on LinkedIn, feel free to connect with me. I try to post uh, daily. It's not always happened depending on how busy I am, uh, but I really like to share stories. But what I share is like insights into things I've experienced. Chances are it's based on a real life story that I experienced that day and I've just cleaned up some of the... Uh, the language so if not to uh, imply too many things um, but yeah and because this is agile minds romania europe um i want to inform you i'm actually gonna be in europe next month twice so you can come see me at scan agile in helsinki on march 6th uh or i'll be at decompiled in dresden on march 8th i'm excited to go to both those places i was scan agile last year i'm excited to go back and decompiled, it's a new one for me. And actually, I've never been to Dresden, so I should have a good amount of fun. But feel free. And I might have discounts for some of those. So reach out to me directly. I'll check see if there's a discount that I can pass on to y'all uh, to either of those conferences. So let me tell you a story. Its title is A New Experiment Each Sprint. Now, as a scrum master, this was music to my ears. Many months of coaching had led to a PO that I was working with to proclaim this as his idea to the team. I was so excited. And then I saw how the experiments were going to be executed. And yeah, Gantt chart speaks for itself. Um, it's ugly. We all know a Gantt chart is immediately wrong the moment it's published uh, because there's so many unknown unknowns out there. But be a good scrum master I knew my client, the product owner, had an outcome in mind. And I was going to make it my mission to help make that happen. But at the time, I just didn't know how. So fast forward to the weekend. And while I'm playing some video games, um, I thought I noticed something on the ground. New experiment, sprint. And then an idea came to my mind. There was going to be a way to execute a new experiment each sprint. And it was embodied in this Triforce. This is the Triforce of predictive delivery. So using the powers of Monte Carlo forecasting, evidence-based management, and WIP limits, I was going to empower my team. So my adventure was off. How I was going to combine those shards, I didn't know yet. But I walked and walked and walked and ran into uh, quite a few uh, plants there. Couldn't move along until I came to Dungeon 1. Except for some reason, it says Monte Carlo. Whatever, that's all right. Let's head on in. In this dungeon, I approach the wizard with a cryptic message and offer this sage piece of advice. Which is dangerous to go alone. Take this. And the first thing he offered me was Monte Carlo forecasting. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Monte Carlo forecasting, but... I would love for you to uh, emote a little bit. Have you used Monte Carlo forecasting uh, in your practices? See Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, if I get any of it wrong, feel free to correct me. I'm, le I'm I learn every day. So let's talk a little bit about Monte Carlo forecasting. Um, it's actually it's it's quite old. I think at this point about eighty years old. It actually came from the U.S. at the Los Alamos Laboratory during World War II. 
uh, which is where they were developing the A-bomb. Um, but its core principles involved repeated random samplings of data to achieve numerical results. And it was named, actually, in honor of the Monte Carlo Casino in Monaco. Now, for our purposes, though, we want to talk about our real historical data, our data probably from JIRA, whatever tool you use, and what we've actually done to attempt to predict what we might do. That's quite the mouthful. Like, if you think about um, other ways of predicting in, uh, in software development, you might take your sprint velocity, do rolling averages. The problem with that is it's very deterministic. It's saying, I'm going to do this based on what's happened. But with Monte Carlo forecasts, we actually get into this concept of probabilistic, where it's what we might do. And it's actually stronger because it's based on, on data. And if you, once you can get people's minds wrapped around it, it becomes this really powerful concept where um, your commitment moves away from this like absolute determinism and, be, and becomes more of a flexible thing. Like I think Martin Dalmin says, um, he calls them his sprint goals, what is it? Humble planning. Humble planning is the term he uses. And Monte Carlo can feed into that. So when I first heard about it, I, I can't really remember, but you know, a lot of my best memories with Monte Carlo come from the Drunk Agile podcast with Dan Vacanti and Pratik Singh. And also, if you've read Dan's college level book, Predict Actual Actionable Agile Metrics for Predictability, an introduction. I mean, if that's as a college level title, I don't know what it is. Uh, this is so deep. But when I read it and I heard about it, I thought, this is really neat. I got to try that. And I tried to replicate it with various spreadsheets, but you don't get that same level of randomness uh, in, a, in a spreadsheet because it was complex. Um, but it was something I kind of held off to the side in the past because I'm always learning new things, putting them into my into my toolkit and not always have time to apply them. So, But I had this and I had this this problem, this um, idea of a new experiment sprint that they, they, the PO wanted to use. And I thought this might be a tool as part of that. And it it is, it's, it's, it's one of those corners of the Triforce. So how does it look? So back in the real world, this is how it kind of looks. This is the result of running some Monte Carlo simulations on sprint data. I drew this, this is not from Excel. Um, it was a practice drawing. Um, and really what it's about is this concept of predictability or probability over false certainty. Because like a um, Gantt chart has a lot of certainty built into it. That's not always what's going to happen. And so what this shows you on the bottom is the total number of items completed. This is not story points. I'm working with items, but can work with story points too. And the, the vertical bars is occurrences. So if we run this over a thousand simulations, what this is telling me in the simulations, 85% of the time, we're going to get probably five items done based on past performance. 70% of the time, we're going to get seven items done based on past performance. Now, the one thing Monte Carlo doesn't give you, it doesn't tell you which five items or which seven items. It just says, based on your past performance, this is what you're going to do. And then you got to think also of the inverse of that. There's a 30% chance that we won't get seven done a 15% chance we won't get five done. And so that's where you really have to figure out like how, what's the level of risk you and your team are willing to take. And what this is, is really over a two week sprint. How many items can we probabilistically do? So now let's take a look at, at, at some data. Um, so what I have here is some sprint data. Um, I, I removed some specific descriptions to you know protect the innocent and change the project name to Fred instead of uh, something else. Um, and you've all probably seen this. And so a common thing we do is we start to summarize the data and we end up with a table that kind of looks like this, which says we did this many story points or maybe tracked by PVIs, product backlog items, but like what we've done. And historically, you might like to say, take these things and just average them out, but can we do better? And so, like I mentioned, I've tried spreadsheets, which we just too much, I, they didn't give me the randomness I was looking for, that true randomness. Um, but I did find a tool um, not too long ago. Um, and it's called, uh, it's from Several Wise Games. And they actually have it. It's, it's a Monte Carlo simulator. I did put a, I just added this QR code this morning. Uh, so you can scan it from your phone if you want to, to take a look at this. Um, so if we take this, if we go to this website on our phone, um, you'll end up with this kind of view. And you can put it, put this data in 
by either story count or by uh, velocity, your choice. And we're going to manually input into our data. So we take the, this one, we took the number of PBIs on the left. We put them in for these seven sprints that we had tracked, put them in on the right. And we're going to click um, get results. We click it and we're presented with a table. Now I'm showing you two here. The bottom right one is the one that's based off of story count. But what this does is give us an idea based on our past performance, what we might do. And I wanted to show story count versus velocity because it does work for both of them. So when you see these, for those of you who've worked a little bit with Monte Carlo, uh, have you used several wise games before or have you done it? Oh, no. Says, yeah. um, what, how do you, uh, so if we were a team and you're telling your product owner, what, uh, if we want to look at the number of stories, what, what's your comfort level or with um, telling them how many we might be able to do? What chance would you give us? So yeah, good question, Fred, because I, I saw 50% chance there and you know, tied to it, it's a level of confidence that's uh, called realistic as uh, uh, bet wise, right? But is 50% realistic is <laughs> like, throwing a, a coin, right? Tossing a coin and it's either that or the other. <laughs> so um, uh, good good question. What's the level of confidence you would go, uh, go, who you would go with for your work, for your professional work? Yeah, and that really, it depends on the team and your, and your context, your history of like, yeah. how much churn might your sprint have? Historically, I'm probably more in the 80%, 80 to 85% range. Mm -hmm. It says conservative, it's but it feels realistic because you have humans behind it and they really want to drive to, especially with the sprint goal or that experiment, they want to deliver it. So you, you really can get closer to that. So that's probably where, where I go, but it's a risk tolerance question. You need to work with, you know, your team on. And also like it says bet. I don't like the word bet. I would, you know, but that's, that's so based on this and my comfort level, I'm probably going to say, I'll go with like the, the 13 uh, PBIs uh, or 27 points. Now, if you average these things out, they might actually equal those numbers, but I don't like to work with averages uh, as much as I can. This is what I like to lean into. So that is a brief introduction to uh, Monte Carlo forecasting. And, and from this, we're saying size of our sprint we can probably complete is probably 13 PPIs. So a couple of points to remember. Monte Carlo forecasting is thousands of simulations based on real data. Your real data goes into it. It creates a probabilistic model instead of deterministic. And you have to, that's very clear when you're talking to people about this, especially when you're when you're trying to forecast out maybe a project. Give them those probabilities. Don't, you know, the old way of just looking at rolling averages, it gives them like a certainty. I had this at work with a project working on that keeps growing in scope right now. And I said there's an 85% or 70% chance we'll get done by the beginning of March, 85% by mid-March. And that's the language they're actually using. And it was a lot, it was different for them to get around, but they understand percentage chances. You can use PBIs or story points and Sevwise Games is a great tool. All right, so let's continue on on our adventure. There's more shards to be found. So walking and walking through this uh, very dangerous land of Hyrule, I came across another dungeon, dungeon two, but for some reason it says EBM, you know, that's fine. Let's enter into this dungeon. Once again, we approach. Is this is this the same wizard that we saw before? Uh, but you know, now he's offering me something. You know, which one? Should, which one should I take? Okay, who thinks heart or uh, or potion? And I go for potion. I'm full HP already. So <laughs> wonderful. You got to put that in your back pocket. So all right. So let's see what we should take. We drink the or we put the potion in our back pocket. And the wizard disappears and leaves us with this beautiful graphic about evidence-based management. So who here has used evidence-based management uh, in their work or at least has heard of it? Give some emojis into the chat. Wonderful. Uh, evidence-based management. Once again, if, if you know it greater than me, I don't have my PAL EBM certification. Uh, it's like on my list of things to get in the future. Um, but if you weren't aware, it was created by Ken Schwaber, co-creator of Scrum. 
It was actually released almost a decade ago um, in 2015. It's been iterated a few times. What is that's core is this goal setting framework that seeks to help organizations towards their goals using empiricism, which we as Scrum Masters, we love empiricism. And it's got this great lens of value that's built around everything. It's also it's broken into these four, what they call key value areas, KVAs, current value, unrealized value, time to market, and ability to innovate. Now, historically, I'm a numbers guy. And so ability to innovate really stood out to me when I dove, first dove into this, uh, probably about four years ago. Um, and it is, you know, the second cornerstone, the Triforce. So let's take a look at EBM um, and actually their official graphic. This is this is the official graphic that's on the white paper on scrum.org. You can see those four key value areas, but I want to zoom in on the ability to innovate. Now, one of the awesome things in the EBM guide that's freely available is it's not prescriptive, but there are suggested ways that you can measure all of these key value areas. And, you know, I think also, I think, I know last month, a new book on EBM just came out. Uh, so if you're interested, um, it's on my list of, to read. It's probably, I don't have it yet. I'll go into the stack of books I should read because um, I have too many of those books, but it's a great, uh, great book by, uh, who is it? Those guys behind Your Daily Scrum, Todd Miller and Ryan Ripley and one other person I Patricia Kong, maybe? Maybe she helped with that one. Um, all right, got some thumbs up. And so, like, if we look into ability to innovate, there's a couple ideas you can look at. You can look at, let's say, technical debt, production incident count, active code branches. All of these things have an impact on your ability to innovate your product, to deliver more value quicker to your customer. But as I look through this, there's one that really sparked my interest it was innovation rate and the great thing is like these are just titles you can define them how you like and so the way i defined innovation rate was this idea of this mix between our improvements and our defense it's like you know we if we look back at our sprints there's certain sprints we do a lot of stories like new new work and there's other ones we might do a lot of bugs it might be from something we introduced into production it might be from some old stuff but there's variability generally in your work. Some teams will like say we have a 20% target for bugs or something, whatever it might be. But regardless, like when I was working with this organization, they did not have a set thing. We just did the bugs that needed to get done. And so it creates this variability. And so we think like, well, how many improvements can we really make? So let's take that JIRA data again. This time I've added an issue type column where you can see actually the breakdown between what is stories and bugs. And with this one, we do create a summary table of what we've done. And this one, um, I just count the issues, not the bugs. And you know, I said no averages before, but this one I kind of do look at averages, but I guess I could look at, I could probably do some Monte Carlo forecasting around the number of bugs, now that I think about it. But if you saw this table, how much percentage of your sprint might you suggest to reserve for bugs? Open that up to the floor. Probably around 30%. Yeah. 30%. Yeah, for this, yeah, absolutely. For this example. I probably would say 25%. It means it's a good thing because you'll know they will come in based on what you have done. Um, this is an average, like I said, but this, you know, like it's this is what we do. So why don't we build our experiment around this concept of what we hear me echo. <laughs> uh, around this concept of what we have done instead of what we hope to do or some mandate from from on high. Um, so that's a very, very, very brief introduction to EBM. EBM is large. Each of the key value areas has a lot under it. In addition, like I said, it's a goals, it's a goals based framework, a goal setting framework. And so there's a lot above that where you have immediate goals, intermediate goals, and long-term goals. 
Um, it's huge, very cool stuff. Look into it. So it's like I said, it's goal setting framework based on empiricism, which is Scrum Master Dean Love Empiricism. Uh, focus on those four key value areas. There's so many ways to measure it. And it is backed by, you know, by Ken Schwaber, Scrum.org. It's almost a decade old. So let's take those two cornerstones of the track course, Monte Carlo estimation, innovation rate. Monte Carlo, we say about 13 PBIs. EBM, about 75% innovation. So we put those into a calculator. What, what should our experiment size be? Feel free to unmute. So we put in a calculator, we get about nine, nine PBIs. And that that is the size of our experiment. There you've done it, you've done the sprint planning, but there's the question of like, how do I execute? And this is only two corners of the Triforce. So the adventure is nearing an end. Danger is ever present. Hey, that water looks, looks kind of nice. Um, except for that monster out there. Come across dungeon three, except for some reason it says low metrics. Okay, that's fine. Ah, it's someone different. This is a new character. What is this big secret? Well, it is dipping into our third corner of the Triforce. It's whip limits. Whip limits. Um, who's used who's used uh, whip limits or flow metrics in their uh, in their scrum practice? Absolutely, it's a great thing. Now, one thing I'll say, um, I'm not always a fan of saying limit your whip. There's because there's other ways we can if we can encourage teams to limit their work in progress without putting a hard cap on it, but hard caps are sometimes necessary. So whip limits, uh, if you weren't know, if you didn't know, they do come from lean manufacturing in the Toyota production systems. They've been around for a long time. Um, they aid us by, by focusing on bottlenecks in our system that are stopping our flow in our pull system. And it helps us improve efficiency. There is a law be behind it, behind the, the relationship between um, whip limits and cycle time and throughput. And that's called Little's Law, which is based on this queuing theory um, from Dr. Little, probably, I can't remember, might have been 100 years ago. Um, so why does this matter? Because as our work in progress, whip work in progress goes up unbounded because of no limit. And if our throughput, what we are delivering remains about the same, our cycle time goes up. And what's the problem with this? It's taking longer to learn, were we right or were we wrong? So there's a mantra with whip limits, like say, which is stop starting and start finishing. Now, uh, okay, there we go. So yeah, like I said here, here's a little visualization of Little's law. You can see the math or maths, if you're from England, depending where you live. Um, cycle time is on the left. And you can figure that out by taking the amount of items that are in progress and dividing it by how many you complete. Now, I heard this for so many times. You got to do whip limits. You got to have all these things to improve your flow. But like, I would never personally observed it. And so how does it actually play out in software engineering? And recently, I had a great example where I saw it in action. So what I have here is some data from Actionable Agile. And actually, I layered three different charts on top of each other. Uh, we have the green, which is the cycle time. And that one has the, uh, on the right side of the screen, that is its axes. The red is the work in progress, which is on the left side of the screen, the axes. And at the bottom, we have our throughput, which is also in the, the axes on the left side. And so what I want to draw your attention to is this first inflection point. This is before I got to the organization. And this is where the product team asked the developers to push themselves. Well, we have a deadline. We got to push ourselves. We got to start working more on more things. And what you can see here is that the work in progress started going up. And it, as you continue, it goes up. And then, but the cycle time wasn't going up. Well, that's because cycle time is a lagging metric. And one thing is when people start pushing themselves, they can only do it for a certain amount of time. It's not sustainable. And eventually get to this point where cycle time starts going up dramatically. And so the team, they weren't finishing work and work was taking longer. It caused a lot of concern. And so what I did is I introduced this concept right about here 
called Aging Whip. And with this, you could see a thing started to started to trend down. What we focused on was like, how do we start getting things done instead of start starting new things? And once again, cycle time, it's a lagging metric. So you can start to limit your work in progress by focusing on finishing things. Then the cycle time catches up. And what you see at the end of this is the cycle time is better than where we started. And we're keeping whip low. And, and thing of note is that on the bottom, this throughput line, it stayed about average. We're finishing, it was like 0 0.5 to 1.5 things per day. Um, and I didn't do it via coaching like hard limits. But this is this is what I did. And so if What's you work so with here, go ahead. My budget. Oh. <laughs> Um, if you work with Jira, uh, which I do, that's what I'm based on. What we have here on the left monitor, if you're lucky enough for organizations that invest in actionable agile, I'm not sponsored. You can bring up this aging whip report on a daily basis. And what you focus on is those ones at the very top in the red section, maybe even the orange section. Ask what's getting in the way of those getting done. How can we collectively as a team start getting those things done? Now, if you don't have actionable agile, that's perfectly fine. But if you still use Jira, they introduced Jira introduced this insights tab uh, well, sometime in the past year or so, which does a lot of the similar things. Well, this you can just open up the insights tab and look at these items that are stuck and ask those same questions because what it identifies is things that are taking longer than things on average do. Um, this team had a lot of stuck items. This was a um, operations team and so there was i think 17 stuck items there and the way we've been going about this is every day at the daily stand up for this team we just look at the three oldest things on that list and it'll get cleaned up over time because um, i think it builds in a better muscle than trying to do like one big bang like let's clear them all out that doesn't that doesn't create those habits for success and so if you use jira great actionable agile going back to that one if you're using Azure DevOps, there's also a plugin for that. But either way, if you start looking at those aging whip, aging work in progress, it'll help you start finishing things sooner, which helps you in that triforce of predictive delivery. So briefly about whiff limits, based on queuing theory, like walking in online, it assumes a stable system. There's a relationship between throughput, how much you're getting done, cycle time, how long it's taking, and how much work is in progress. A phrase to remember, stop starting and start finishing. It's a great one. The teams understand that one. And if you're lucky enough, you can use Action Agile with your insights. So the Triforce is now formed. But we get down, like, how do you actually execute this thing? Well, back to the video game. Got the sweet bow and arrow. Decided to walk around for a while, just start shooting randomly. And when I finally got bored, found a cave. This cave, what does it say? It says happiness. What's going on in there? What do I do? Let's go in. Oh no, it's Ganon, the final boss of Legend of Zelda. Um, it's a good thing I've been practicing with that bow and arrow because that's where the real world really puts the Triforce into action. And we got him. So, but how's that look for you on a daily basis, on a sprint basis? You're all probably familiar with a drawing similar to this one. It's our standard scrum cycle. So the way we talked about, we have our we first thing we do is take our Monte Carlo estimate. These are the number of work items we'll probably do. Time our innovation rate, and that's where we get that sprint planning we have talked about. And then your sprint's ready to go. But then say, what about daily scrum? That's where we're bringing that aging work in progress to keep things moving through the system. And the other thing you want to do is we want to talk about on a daily basis, like, is our sprint goal at risk? I know it's un slightly unrelated, but it's a thing you should be asking about. And if you do all those things, you get a very happy and excited Scrum Master and product owner and team, and you're able to get those experiments done. So there it is, your map for the Triforce. And here's in, in all its glory, the Triforce of predictive delivery. It's about that body car low forecasting, like how many work items can you probably do in a sprint? EBM, which is how much of our work is dedicated to innovation. And the whip limits, stop starting and start finishing. That you get the happy team. 
And there you go. You've so successfully brought peace to Hyrule for your scrum team. But as a scrum master, you know another quest starts tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Very, very good. I like it a lot. Uh, there are some uh, some questions in the in the mural, and um, I will I will uh, start uh, uh, with uh, one really interesting. How can you quantify the moral of the team across a period of time and input that also in the Monte Carlo simulation? <laughs> uh, morale of the team as a yeah. as Nectar. Um, I think that's what's probably just that special sauce that a scrum master as a coach brings. If you're mo if you're noticing like maybe it's cameras are going off, uh, people are less talkative. I mean, I'd be bringing that up with the team during retros or with your product owner, um, because it definitely will impact be impact what you do. And the great thing I guess with Monte Carlo is those morale issues. Um, they'll be evidenced by the delivery. So delivery will start to become erratic, which is where this probabilistic forecasting, taking your actual data and doing it over simulations uh, will actually lead to a close result of what you might do versus just rolling averages. Um, so I don't know if there's a real good way to quantify it. Um, I'm just going to observe it. I mean, there probably are tools you can use like the um, what is it? Uh, Spotify Team Health Index and various tools like that. Uh, Calumnity uh, from the Liberators is another one. Uh, tools you can use to actually can bring some uh, tangible data into that. Um, but it probably stays a little bit away from Monte Carlo. Okay. Uh, there is another question. What are you using for Monte Carlo forecasting in Europe? Probably you responded with that uh, Sega uh, game. Sega Wise, tool. yep. Sega Wise, Sega Wise uh, tool. And uh, there's a question from Mihai here IBM Wise. If your ability to innovate is limited by the high number of bugs, how do, you, do we improve it? So, any tips and tricks for Mihai? Yeah, I, I get this question a lot from teams. Say, well, we, we would like to improve on our product and build value. And we know the EBM principles uh, highlight the way you have to distribute your effort towards different areas. But hey, uh, tough luck. Uh, we have escape defects. We have a lot of uh, complaining customers and there's a lot of uh, bugs to be fixed. So how do we improve our ability to innovate since uh, we, we need to work so much on... Uh, maintenance yeah that's a good good question and you know I think what you're getting at is there's a some kind of a rot in the core of your platform with maybe some technical debt that's causing these issues and so the way i've tackled it um, is is probably by having not probably um, a good tool to use with the team first off is like a lean coffee uh, where you can start to surface these things through like a uh, like what's a question sometimes I like to throw out is what's getting in the way of us doing our best work every day. You want like the great thing is like it's concise, with because it doesn't and it's it's not leading, so it gives people the opportunity to tell you anything. It might be the coffee in the lunchroom sucks. Maybe that could whatever it might be, but you get a variety of ideas without with. For the team's benefit without you as the coach or scrum master leading them to where you think they need to go. Um, so once you do get this, this list of what gets in their way, it then it takes that scrum master or coach talking to the organization in such a way to say, hey, listen, we have these problems. This is what it's going to take to fix them. Um, and by continuing to add to the debt, we're going to slow down our ability to deliver. And one thing people in business, they understand is compound interest of debt. So if you can relate this technical debt that we have to money, they say, oh, we need to pay some of that off. One practice I have, I'm doing, starting with a team right now, an operations team, is they're having to make a bunch of really bad decisions right now because they have this this high amount of work. We look, I looked at their throughput and arrival rate last month and tickets are arriving 
almost twice as fast as we're finishing them. This is growing out of control. And it seems having to make a lot of potentially short-term decisions to, um, to satisfy today, but they know it's at the risk of tomorrow. And so I'm introducing a, uh, when they move a ticket to done in JIRA, uh, just a little yes, no, like, hey, will, we, will this work require follow-up work? Will and this work five years later, right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but it's like well, you know, like say they didn't document it, or they just, or they did some copy paste. Well, I'm not a developer, so I'm not going to say what they do. But sometimes they know, like this isn't the best. This this is way too pragmatic. We don't want to go to dogmatic, which is everything like perfect, right? but we got to find that line between. And so we want to start to quantify for stakeholders how many decisions we're making on a per iteration that are actually leading us down this path of worsening our plan. And so that's what I'm going to do. I don't have any results, but it's just the plan. Okay. So to paraphrase, uh, Fred, uh, I think you mentioned the, the knowledge of the crowd, right? Of the team, uh, Lean Coffee or whatever exercise you can facilitate, get the information from the team. Hey, what could have possibly led to this situation we're in? then uh, support them in, in taking the actions they need to, to do it and uh, also work as a scrum master or leader uh, with the organization to get the impediments uh, um, uh, closed sooner by providing them with resources or ideas from stakeholders that could have uh, some benefit to, to their actions. Okay. Good summarization. I, I do, I like, I want to go back to that question. Uh, what gets in the way of you doing your best every day? It's such a simple idea. Exactly. It really opens people up to like, it could be anything. Great. Uh, another question. How did your team react when you presented this to, to uh, this to them? <laughs> this Triforce? <laughs> uh, I didn't call it the Triforce at that point uh, because I didn't have that name yet. But there was a power in naming it. But when I presented to the team, they loved the idea of an experimental, like how they could approach it, because there's a lot of stress on the team for how to deliver a lot of things in a short amount of time. I mean, the Gantt chart was not a lie. There was a lot of asks from the business, but we needed to make the reality. So the team really appreciated a, an approach versus just work harder, because the Gantt chart just says work harder. Um, and we What I will say, like, in reality, how it turned out is... Um, I'm going to stop my screen share because it's been going on for too long. <laughs> um, the first sprint, we were able to actually deliver an experiment. It was beautiful. And then the next sprint, a reorg happened because they wanted to adjust the way people, like who was working with who. And by the time I was able to get back into that, uh, my engagement with the company ended. So I wasn't able to pull it back up. So I did have one really successful one and i laid the front the groundwork for it to happen again in the future okay <laughs> have you used the banana peel technique for aging rip <laughs> no tell me about it. whoever wrote that i'd love to hear it <laughs> yeah uh, I, I can i can detail so you you mentioned fred if you don't have budget for actionable agile you can just use jira right for for measuring uh, aging whip so i thought what what if we don't have a budget for jira either right because <laughs> that could yeah. be the case right so i remember the story from back uh, when i had my psk class with the i think uh, pst john coleman right christina i think we, we were colleagues in that class uh, john told us well uh, people used to measure aging whip like this when they started uh, uh, a new story or a new work item uh, they were hanging a banana peel on it and if that banana peel uh, lasted for two days three days mm, it was getting mm, a bit nasty like brown a little or mm, but if it took i don't know one week or even more mm, it started to be smelly or <laughs> it really rottens <laughs> the banana peel. So the, the developers in the team were really concerned. Let's let's get rid of that one because the banana peel coming with it, it's too old and it's gonna um, mess up the entire environment in the, in our team. So I, I thought, yeah, it, it's a nice metaphor uh, or a joke. So yeah, I, I just brought it up because I I I, I got the um, um, options uh, you you presented and I said, well. Maybe you can even, I don't know, mark the date when you started the work, right? Mark mark the date on each work item. And yeah, just compare the current date 
with the, with the date you started and uh, have that pulled in from uh, uh, your um, ticketing system could be anything I, I some at some point we've been using uh, uh, Redmine or a free a free tool right but it had some apis we could extract some data from there so just by comparing the current date with the date uh, the item started you can get that information of the age uh, of which item uh, each item that is in uh, progress so yeah maybe not the banana peel <laughs> if it stinks i but at least i love this i wrote it down so i can if yeah. this talk gets <laughs> this one of these like gets accepted uh, okay. Or next time I do it, I will have that as a as a yeah, third option. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you can find reference of it. I think it's uh, uh, it's been used uh, before, so uh, maybe you can get some some nice picture of it as well. And don't forget to buy a banana when you join the the conference thread. Yes, I will. I will bring a banana and put it up top at the beginning and make people get curious. A little confused, but curious. Like, why does he have a banana? Is he hungry? Or maybe I bring two bananas. Because one banana might be I'm just hungry. But two bananas probably means what the heck is going on? You can't even compare. <laughs> open one at the beginning and then open one at the end. And oh, <laughs> so many good ideas. Thank you. <laughs> okay. The next question for you, Fred, is how do you explain someone coming the traditional way of working that plans resources instead of known work to be done to improve the product that WIP is actually helping optimizing flow rather than hindering it. Um, oh. Yeah. I can I clarify that... if uh, the question is not that clear, if you want friend or... I think I get it, but why don't you go ahead and give me a little clarity on it. Yeah. Um, I was mentioning about the moment, like uh, in the traditional ways of working, like you look at the people that they're going to be developing something and you figure out that, uh, for example, if we're talking metaphors, like a woman is to, let's say, uh, give birth to a child in like nine months. If you put like uh, three women to give birth to the same child, it will not happen in three. So that type of, uh, of connection, I would say. Yeah. And so this is for me, this comes down to the, human connection with that person like through one-on-one -on -one as a scrum master um what i've done is ask them like how about you tell me about a time when your plan worked perfectly tell me about a time when your plan didn't work what happens more more often and then also like has you ever had changes in your team um to really get away from from like the, the concept of resources and hours um, but for me, I think you're the mythical, um, man month or, you know, nine women in one month to make a baby, I think is a really good thing. People can, um, can, uh, understand, um, and visualize, um, the other thing I have done is this comes with some trust with the people to say, hey, can you trust me? Won't we try an experiment for three sprints? Let me try this out. What's the worst that can happen? Um, yeah. And then at the end of the day, numbers speak, speak for themselves. But I'm sorry you don't have like a really good crisp one for that, Bogdan. It, it helped me, Fred. So thank you for okay. the answer. We're all humans yeah, at the end of the day. Let's connect as humans. Yeah, I Radu agree. has a question, I guess. You're muted, uh, Radu. Yes. Oh, first of all, thank you. I think it's the most awesome presentation that I saw in the last year. I'm a huge gamer and I love Excel <laughs> and data sheets and stuff like that. So this was awesome. Um, one thing for, for Bogdan's thing, what, uh, what we did and I think helped a lot was to we have two departments like software engineers and quality verification and we have them together and software engineers always thinks uh, think that everything will work out qv always think that something will break so having that connection within the team 
is awesome. I uh, We've been doing that for the last five, 10 years, just having those teams together. In the past, they were separated. And just having those conversations, you know, getting a different point of view, somebody saying that everything will work out and somebody else saying that, oh, this might break, this might break, this might break, just brings, uh, I don't know, like the, the energy on the floor and you don't need to do anything. You just sit down and watch and they get things figured out. Thank you very much, Radu, for the add-in on that one. That's beautiful. I mean, that's where, you know, you as a Scrum Master, you can create that environment for the team to do that, and you can create that psychological safety. Then the team just takes care of it. I love that. And I, I love how you talk about, like, yeah, developers are very optimistic. They're going to make the best code that has no problems. And then the quality uh, engineers, they're a little bit pessimistic because they've seen it go wrong before. Like breaking the concept of throwing the information over the wall, right? Yeah. Don't build that wall. Break it down. Okay. There is another question uh, in the mural. For Monte Carlo predictions, what will be a sensible size for the data set used? I think mathematically, they say you need 10 units of data in order to create a an estimate. So if you have 10 completed items, you can actually forecast out. For me in my practice, I feel like at least three sprints and ideally six sprints is going to give you that level of confidence in how you can give that, that predictive delivery. But I say from a math perspective, they say 10 units of work can give, start to give you those predictable numbers. Okay. And I, I also have a, a question, Fred. Uh, you had uh, situations uh, with some stakeholders which are asking for a specific date to deliver something, and probably you didn't had 100% uh, to, <laughs> you are not sure. So how do you deal with those kind of stakeholders? I mean, uh, Based on the data that you are uh, are gathering and uh, the predictability, uh, um, what is your speech for them? <laughs> well, one thing I like to say is data, that third person in the conversation that doesn't have a motive. They, the data doesn't care. Data is what it is. A uh, product manager comes in and they want to be very, they have motive to get things done. And, data, and the scrum master might have a motive to come in and protect the team but then they just get that data and so like that's how i say like you can argue all you want but data is what it is and with that i offer to show how like what it is behind it and one thing i didn't show in this that several wise does uh has on there they actually have those, those intervals uh where you can actually see and you can talk to like say this did a thousand uh permutations of what might happen and this is this is how it happened and once I demystify the data, either through Sevilleize or I've done in actual Agile, has a has a um, a what a by when and how many option. I've used the by when option, where I put in like this project has twenty four items remaining, and I can we can scale the team within that. If I put that in to say, hey, this is the data. This is based on history. This is hey, I'm not making this up. You can argue all you want, but you know. The data is what it is, and people find they can't argue with this. So when they do run into the situations where they're like, I don't like what it says, that's where you can comfort them as a, as a human, or you can ask them and say, what can we do? Which part of this project is negotiable? Is there parts we can cut out and still hit whatever our agreement is? Or you know, if we have a hard date, like uh, I think Mihai mentioned the Iron Triangle at the beginning, if we have that fixed date, we do know that scope is a, an adjustment we can make and just have that transparent conversation. And, you know, as we like to think, you know, with empiricism, transparency is a key part of that transparency and inspection adaptation. Be transparent with stakeholders. Sometimes they might not want to listen at all and you got to realize, okay, you know, I did everything I could do. It's going to happen the way it's going to happen. Might have to walk away from the conversation. <laughs> Hopefully, I gave you a couple things. If I may add something to Buanolo's question, uh, so uh, that kept me th thinking as well because he said, "Well, how 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 much data should I have?" Or 
how far should I go back? Right? And yeah, Fred pointed in some uh, mathematical reasoning uh, on what's the number that's uh, minimally effective and uh, experience wise what he uses. But I'm thinking if you're striving for too much data, you could you could get all the data and that's irrelevant. So if I, I'm not I'm not just starting uh, this forecasting because I don't have enough data. Hey, I'm going to collect data for half a year, right? But half a year back, your team was seven members. Now it's five. Uh, half a year back, you didn't have the knowledge of the, the business uh, the way you do now. Half a year back, there's all these uh, things happening, right? Like you, you answered in your questions before, right? A lot of things changing, right? So as long as the data is not relevant anymore, it's useless, right? So you, you, you may start, I think, sooner than later <laughs> because data is getting old. And in a rapidly changing environment, such as our teams have, uh, it's uh, pretty much uh, inconsistent if you rely on all data. And Monte Carlo uh, forecasting anyway is using uh, a lot of simulations, like tens of thousands, hundred thousands, or even million simulations. So the the little data that you have will be randomized so many times that the, the numbers give you some um, quite accurate predictab uh, predictability or forecasting of, of uh, probability. Uh, of what might happen. So better start early than, than too late. That's uh, I think my, my last. Uh... That's great. And what I add on to that is uh, for this team I'm predicting this project for that I said at the beginning of March or middle of March, there's a developer, their lead developer going on vacation for six weeks. And I told them, I was very clear. I'm like, listen, any data after this date gets away from the math and gets to guessing because we don't know the impact this is going to truly have on the team, except for knowing things are gonna take a, we're gonna go slower because we're down a member. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great example. Did you read my question, Mihai? Because that's why I asked on-, no, on no, I haven't. Because if the data was normalized in the way that if you looked at, any things that changed, and if you rem if you removed any outliers, like if you had any things that were out of the boundaries, have you kept them in or left them out? Uh, I think from a math perspective, extreme outliers, if they're minimal, will get minimized. If it's just like what yeah, so doing, normalization, yeah, yeah, which yeah. averages don't do, but if you have a lot of outliers, that actually becomes your normal. And so then it takes that into consideration. So they are no longer outliers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great point, Radu. It's it's good thing Christmas comes only once a year, right? <laughs> uh, but what, one thing I noticed, Fred, in your presentation, and I was not totally aware of that. Um, I, I knew, of course, people are using Monte Carlo simulations with um, flow metrics. But um, I've seen an example where you do that um, using also velocity, like putting in the complexity complexity measurement of work during the past few sprints, right? Instead of uh, the throughput, like the number of items. And how did how did this work for you? Is it similarly relevant uh, as uh, as the numbers you get from from the simulation? You find it better or uh, lower performing than uh, than when used against throughput. In a stable mature team, they will they'll, they'll they'll play out very similarly. And actually I first started doing it originally was with story points and mm -hmm. it felt more complex than it needed to be and so I I actually did it side by side against uh uh units of work. Okay. And that played out it was much easier to understand but you know this is where getting to know your client, your customer, your team, sometimes story points are so ingrained in what they do, it's not worth the fight about it because it's not about the points. It's about creating that predictive space where the team can deliver. So it can work and I did it, but uh, for a stable team, it, a stable team who has like, uh, what is, like right-sized stories, it's going to be, either way is going to give you a good, good plan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I think it would take away the subjectivism, right, of uh, ranging the, the complexity. 
uh, when you're just numbering right side stories is just you know, more, than, I like... more than a bar right <laughs> and, and, if I, and if i if i if i'm getting really spicy and i want to get into a story point conversation i'll ask someone like does five one point stories equal one five point story and they go no so doesn't oh, <laughs> <laughs> we count them the same in the math but they're not yeah um, then yeah. Like, yeah, this is yeah, <laughs> where, where my my uh, curiosity took me. So uh, yeah, mathematics works similarly, but uh, the the um, objectivism is less with the story points, right? It, you get more subjective about it. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you. Any any other questions for for Fred? I think we are uh, approaching uh, the end of, of our time uh, for today. Day morning for Fred tonight for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Put my LinkedIn in the chat. Feel free connect with me. Say we we met here. Um, if you want, and Let's like I said, if you're Fred, and uh, absolutely it. And I'll be in Europe in a again. Month. Join again the club here, right? <laughs> I'll do it as often as my schedule allows. You know, this is you know during. During work, so I gotta pick and choose where I go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. Awesome uh, mm -hmm. to have you here, and looking forward for the next uh, sessions. Uh, uh, looking forward to to see you. Maybe if we have the chance uh, live in uh, in Europe uh, later this year. Uh, good luck uh, with uh, the presentations uh, and uh, with the future uh, uh, conferences. Uh, I I do hope that you will have uh, more and more uh, talks. Um, Let's get you, Fred in, in Romania for a conference, Florin. So. Yes, yes, uh, we are we are thinking about uh, a conference here, Fred. So uh, uh, we are thinking also to to invite you here. That'd be wonderful. And I would say, like, I don't need extra money to go. I just I have family, so I just probably need a little help with either with accommodations or maybe airfare. So, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm aside from that, you don't need to pay me a giant speaker fee. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll share uh, when this goes out. I'll make sure to share from, to everybody from the gaming community in Bucharest. I work at Electronic Arts, so probably. Great, great, Radu. <laughs> make sure they join the Agile, Agile Minds community. And I told them, well. like, this is Zelda. Like, actually <laughs> Zelda. <laughs> Wonderful. Excellent. Okay. All right. Cool. Thanks, Thank you, everybody. Thanks for hosting me. Thank, Thank you, Fred. you very much. Sir. Talk to you soon. Right. Thank you, everybody, for joining Thank us. Thank you. And uh, looking forward to have you again for the next meetup. Cheers. Bye very much. Have a nice evening. Keep in touch on the LinkedIn group to figure out the next topic, and we'll announce the, the date there as well. So thanks for being engaging and. Uh, uh, participating into this uh, this discussion after Fred's uh, Fred's talk tonight, and see you all soon. See you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.